We are very glad that to be together. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Wes, and I'm a part of the pastoral team here at Ebenezer. And whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, it is always very good to be together. This morning, we're going to be continuing through our amazing grace series as we journey through the Gospel of Mark. And for our time this morning, we're going to be looking at the prayer life of Jesus, but specifically looking at how prayer can be restful. And so for our teaching passages, I'm gonna, they're going to be a little bit scattered around the Gospel of Mark this morning. But let me read these passages for us, and then we will dive in together. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Mark 6, 45 and 46. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And finally, Mark 6, verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Let's pray together as we open God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence and your goodness and your love here this morning. Thank you that your word tells us that when two or more are gathered in your name, that you are there in the midst of us. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence here. And by your Holy Spirit, we ask that you will speak to us, Jesus. We ask that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would encourage us where we need to be encouraged, that you would challenge us where we need to be challenged. And I confess, Lord, that as I speak now, I acknowledge I can do nothing apart from you. So I ask for the empowering presence of your Holy Spirit. If anything that I am about to say is of you, God, I pray that you would plant it deep within our hearts and lives and that it would bear much good fruit. And I ask that if there's anything that is not of you, that it would just quickly fall to the side and bear nothing. I ask this for your honor and your glory, Jesus. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, this past February, my wife, uh, along with a number of our CNC leaders, we had the opportunity to take them to a conference in Cochrane, Alberta, and this was called the Emerging Leaders Summit. Every couple of years, the Baptist General Conference, that's our denomination, we host an event to, in order to encourage and speak into our young and up-and-coming leaders to say, we see you and we want to invest in you. And this was a really good time together. It was really encouraging. We had a lot of fun. The Lord was working in some really powerful ways over the course of that time. Uh, and it's, we all left very encouraged, but we also left very tired. Uh, February for me was just one of those months where everything kind of piled up at the same time. In February, we had our annual break free event. Then two weeks later, we were going to this conference. Then we got home from the conference on the Sunday, only to turn around on the Tuesday and we headed off to our staff planning days. And on top of that, I was up to preach that weekend. And so February was just a very, very full month for me. Have you ever had those seasons where the combination of extra events, they coincide with your normal rhythms and routines of things? And even though everything that you're a part of is very good and you're excited to do these things, you end up looking at your schedule and you're just going like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this, right? Has anybody ever been there? I think we all have. And while I am a believer that a kind of unrelenting busyness is probably one of the biggest challenges to a vibrant spiritual life in our day, I'm also realistic. And I understand that there are going to be times and seasons where things kind of pile up and the next thing you know, your week or your month is just incredibly full. But it's in moments like this that we actually find the context of our scripture today. The context of each of our passages is one of fullness and activity. There is lots going on in the life and ministry of Jesus and his disciples. 
In Mark chapter 1, we see just a snapshot in the day of the life of Jesus. Jesus starts off his day by teaching in the synagogue. It's an amazing sermon. Everyone is raving about it. He leaves the synagogue to heal a demon-possessed man, and after that, the word starts to spread about him like crazy. He then goes to Peter's house where Peter's mother-in-law lay sick and in bed with a fever, and he goes over and heals her. And he's clearly hungry and wanting his post-church lunch. And he and his boys, they need something to eat. And so Peter's mom just gets up and starts fixing them food like any mother does. And so maybe they had a little bit of a reprieve in the afternoon. We're not sure. But by the evening, the entire town has showed up at Peter's house. And they're bringing all the sick and all the demon-possessed. And now there's a whole evening of ministry. All of this is happening in one day, okay? If this were me, I would need a major sleep recovery day following day after this much activity. But where do we see Jesus after this huge day of activity? Mark 1, 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Late into the evening, just the day before, Jesus is pouring himself out in teaching, in preaching, in healing, in exercising demons. These, this is incredibly physically and spiritually exhausting work. And yet, this is where Jesus went to be replenished. He went to the place of prayer. Let's look at our next context in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 starts off by Jesus sending the disciples out two by two in order to preach and proclaim the good news. And they're coming back from their missionary trip, and they're both excited to tell Jesus everything that has happened and all that they've been doing, but they are also tired, right? This has been a long trip, and they, they want to get some alone time with their rabbi, which is next to impossible because there's so many people around. And so Jesus grabs a boat and he tells his guys, okay, guys, get in the boat. We're going to go to the other side of the lake and we'll get some alone time there. So they all hop into the boat, go to the other side of the lake. But the crowds are clamoring around Jesus so much. They know where he's going to go. They beat him to the other side of the lake. And when, when the disciples get to the other side of the lake, there's already a massive crowd of people there. There's multitudes. And Jesus looks at the multitudes and he has compassion on them. And I love how the disciples respond to Jesus in this moment because it is so honest and relatable. Here they are, right? They've just done this missions trip. They're so pumped to be able to get some one-on-one time with Jesus, tell him everything that's happened. And then this crowd of people shows up again. And this is what they say to Jesus in Mark 6, 35 and 36. By this time, It was already late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. The disciples look at their rabbi and they're like, Jesus, we're tired. Like we've got, we've had next to no time with you. We've just gotten back from this mission trip. It was amazing, but we want to be able to talk to you about it. And then these thousands of people show up and they're hungry and we're getting hangry and they're getting hangry. Can you just nicely tell them to take a hike? Like we just want to get some time with you, right? And this is what they're saying to him. And Jesus is tired too, right? He's been teaching them probably for hours at this point. And he looks at his disciples and he says, well, you should feed them, right? And, and could you, I could imagine that there were at least a few eye rolls from the disciples, right? Like, feed them? Are you kidding me? We're in the middle of freaking nowhere. We can't just go do a Costco run right now. Like, we don't have any money. We don't have, like, what are we supposed to do here? We've got a couple loaves of bread and a couple of, what, a couple of fish. What do you want us to do? And so they take the loaves and the fish that they have, they bring it to Jesus, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he distributes distributes it to the disciples, and lo and behold, a miracle happens, and the food begins to multiply, and these thousands of people who are sitting at the side of this lake, they get fed, and this amazing miracle happens. 
But it's right after this long, incredible day of ministry again that we see Jesus here doing the same thing. Mark 6, 45 through 46. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Again, after a long, tiring, incredible day of ministry, Jesus goes off to pray. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus needs to be replenished, he goes to pray? When he is tired in body and in soul, that's when he goes to pray. And as I was meditating on these passages in preparation for the message this morning, I was just struck afresh again at how Jesus operates. You see, I've been taught to pray that, or I've been taught that you should pray ahead of the event, right? You need to pray before you go to preach. You need to pray before you start your busy day of work. You need to pray before your exam. You need to, whenever you're about to start something, you should pray ahead of it. And I'm not against that in any way. That's very much how I operate, okay? Scripture says, pray without ceasing. It is always an appropriate time to pray. But this isn't what we see Jesus doing in our passages. What we see in the scriptures is that the workday is over. The ministry is done. And yet this is where Jesus chooses to pray. This is where he goes. Prayer is is the place where he is replenished. Prayer is the place where he is renewed. It's where he rests. And I was so struck by this as I was preparing the message because I think that for so many of us, we view prayer as a kind of labor. We are presented with massive challenges in our lives and we are called to pray, right? Whether that is awful world events or there's tragedies, or there's health crises, or there's relational strife in our family or friendships. Whatever it is, these things, they beckon us to pray. And let me be clear, I believe in that kind of prayer. Intercession where we stand in the gap on behalf of another and we, we bring their concerns before the throne of God. That is incredibly important. I'm not minimizing that at all. But my fear is, is that for many of us, Perhaps that's the only way that we view prayer. Let me just play out a scenario for you. The service finishes up here, and you make your way through the foyer. You go over to the chapel, and you grab a cup of coffee. And the next thing you know, you see someone that you haven't seen in a while, and you go, oh, man, I need to catch up with them. And so you go over and sit down at one of their tables, and you start chit-chatting. Hey, how are you doing? What's been happening? And they begin to tell you that they've been having some really serious health concerns. They've been dealing with a lot of pain. And you can see in their face that it's not just the pain that they're dealing with. It's also the anxiety of the unknown that they're feeling. And you can see the stress in their eyes. And you look at them as you're engaging in this conversation. You go, oh my goodness, I didn't know this was happening. I'm going to pray for you. But you leave the conversation. You You don't pray for them in the moment. You leave the conversation. And Monday hits, and you got meetings, and you got stuff to do, and you got errands to run. And then the week goes by, and it's just full, one thing to the next. And the next thing you know, a couple weeks goes by, or maybe a month, and then you see that person again. And when you see them, it triggers it in your head. You're like, oh man, I totally didn't pray for them, right? Is this relatable to anybody here? (laughs) No, okay, just me. Okay, that that feels really great, okay? Awesome. I feel like a wonderful pastor right now. Okay. I think that this is an experience a lot of us can relate to. That type of prayer, truly interceding for someone, carrying their burdens into the presence of God, that is a kind of work, and it's important. It's necessary. We see Jesus interceding for people all over the place in the Scriptures. But that's not what we see him doing here. And when he he is entering into prayer, not as work, but as rest, it's where he's going to be refilled. When he is emotionally and spiritually and physically exhausted, he goes to pray. 
And this leads me to think that maybe Jesus didn't see prayer simply as intercession, but maybe Jesus discovered something about prayer that was restful, that there was a place in prayer he could go to that wasn't about labor or striving or trying to get things done, but about simply resting with God. And as I look at this honestly, I ask myself, what am I missing? Because if I'm totally honest with you, when I'm physically and emotionally exhausted, my mind drifts towards zoning out, okay? Just pull out the phone, scroll for a while, get sucked into a YouTube vortex, right? And it's just like, that, that's where I'm tempted to go, if I'm being honest with you. But this leads me to think, is there a place of prayer that is actually more about rest than about work? Is there a place of prayer that we can cultivate in our lives that is more about simply being with God than about just laying out our list of requests and desires? And I believe that there is. And for the rest of our time this morning, I want to examine this invitation that Jesus makes to his disciples in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. So let's read it again. Mark 6, verse 31. Then... Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. In the midst of a very busy and hectic schedule, the disciples did not even have a chance to eat. I know every mom in this room knows exactly what this verse is talking about, right? My wife heats up her tea like three, four times a day because of constant interruptions, right? This is just how it goes sometimes, right? In the midst of a hectic and busy schedule, this is where Jesus makes his invitation. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. And for the rest of our time this morning, I just want to look at that one verse. That's all I want to do. There are four components, again, of what Jesus says here. And I want to give a bit of time to each. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So let's begin with the first one. Come with me. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, there are repeated phrases like this where he calls his people to come to him. In Matthew 4.19, he tells Peter to leave his nets, leave his life of fishing behind, and to come and follow him. He tells the crowds in Matthew 11.28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Again and again, Jesus' ministry is marked by invitation. And Jesus, in our passage, he says to his disciples, He says to us, come with me. Come with me. I want to be with you. When you say to someone, come with me, it's because you actually want to be with them. And sometimes the biggest hindrance to our life of prayer is we don't think God actually wants to be with us. right? We can know in our heads that God loves us and he wants to be with us, But sometimes there is a disconnect between our head and our hearts. And we might know that God loves us and we might know that he wants to be with us, but maybe we don't truly believe it. And if that is you, you need to hear this invitation of Jesus saying to you specifically, come be with me. Come, let's spend some time together. I want to be with you. The first place of growing in prayer as rest is recognizing Jesus' invitation to you personally. The second place we can grow in prayer as rest is in the next phrase where he says, by yourselves. Jesus here is speaking about the importance of solitude. Rhythms of solitude are absolutely necessary if we are going to create a restful life of prayer with God. Henry Nouwen writes, Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to just be with God and listen to Him. 
In describing more of what solitude is, Ruth Haley Barton writes, Solitude is a place. It is a place in time that is set apart for God and God alone. A time when we unplug and withdraw from the noise of interpersonal relationships, from the noise of busyness and constant stimulation associated with life in the company of others. Moses encountered God on Mount Sinai in the burning bush in solitude. Elijah encountered God in the cave where he heard the still small voice in solitude. And Jesus overcame the temptations of the enemy in the wilderness in solitude. We cannot expect to build a life of God with God without solitude. Now, when I say solitude, we can be tempted into thinking that I mean solitary confinement. And that is the worst punishment that a person can endure. That's not at all what I'm talking about here. I'm also not speaking about disengaging from community or meaningful relationships. Loneliness is an epidemic in our world today. And as our culture continues to advance more and more in technology, our technology actually subtly deceives us into thinking that we are these autonomous beings who don't need anybody else, right? Why do I need a home-cooked meal sitting around with family and friends when I can just scroll my phone, put it in Uber Eats or a skip the dishes and get the food delivered right to me, right? Technology subtly deceives us into thinking we don't really need other people. We're fine on our own. And that's not what solitude is. Solitude is not solitary confinement, nor is it disengaging from meaningful community. But solitude is this. It's about being alone with God. It's about being alone with God. And both of those things are so important. When you experience true solitude, you come into a greater awareness of Emmanuel, God with you. Richard Foster writes in the celebration of discipline, he says, loneliness is an inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. If we possess inner solitude, we do not fear being alone, for we know that we are not alone. But not only do you come into a greater awareness of God with you in solitude, you also come into a greater awareness of all of the stuff that you're maybe carrying around inside of you in solitude. See, we live in a culture today that idolizes and celebrates busyness, right? You ask anybody, how are you doing? What's the first thing they say? Oh, I'm doing good, but I'm busy. Busy is the preferred adjective that we use to describe our lives. How are you doing? I'm busy. How's it going? I'm busy. I'm busy, right? We wear it like it's a badge of honor, as if there's some subtle way that we're like, oh, it, I got to be busy. If I'm not busy, I'm not doing good. Hey, everybody, look look how busy I am. Look how I'm, I'm like I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown, but I'm busy. I'm doing great, right? And this is, this, this culture is insane. And the kind of busyness that we are encouraged to live at is ridiculous. This does not encourage us into a life of solitude where we stop long enough to listen to God in the quiet, okay? And oftentimes that is the space and the place where the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you is in that place of solitude. But for some of us, the fear of what we might discover there is too much. And so instead of willingly entering into solitude to rest and to come before God, we just keep our heads down, we just plow, and we just book ourselves with more and more stuff, and we just like fill our lives and our days with all this crazy activity, and we do all of these things, and we're just like, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And a lot of it is good things. I'm not saying they're bad. But sometimes we fill our lives and we fill our schedules with all of these things, and then we get to the end of it and we're like, look at all I did. Look at all the stuff I did. God must be pleased with me. Look at how hard I worked. Look at all the things I did. And maybe, just maybe, the thing that the Lord is asking of you is not your activity, but maybe it's the willingness to slow down, to stop, to get into the secret place, to get into a place of solitude where you can truly 
hear his voice. Maybe that is what he's actually asking of you. We need solitude. We need a long time with God. The third part of Jesus' invitation is this, to a quiet place. This is the call to silence. Now, all of the great spiritual teachers, they talk about silence and solitude together. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. But silence, just like solitude in our world today, it is not a cultural value for us. In fact, our culture is marked by noise. It is a steady, never-ending racket that is only aimed to heighten your fear and prime your anger. Okay? C.S. Lewis writes in the Screwtape Letters that the enemy's plan is to war against silence in order to ruin the Christian. He says that the devil's kingdom is a kingdom of noise, and he claims that in the end we will make the whole universe a noise in the end. Our world wages war against silence, and if we are honest with ourselves, we don't really do much to help. How many of us, without even thinking of it, we always have to have music on when we get in our vehicle. We always have to have a podcast on when we go for a walk. We always, we're doing stuff around the house. We need to be, we need to have something on. We need to have the TV going. We need to have this constant swirl of noise because we just like the noise. Okay? Many of us live in this perpetual state of noise and racket. It's just this low-grade hum all of the time, and then we wonder why it's hard to hear God's voice. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they will follow me. The promise of Jesus is that if you're his child, you do hear his voice, and you will hear his voice. But guess what? If our lives are a constant blur of racket, yes, it is going to be hard to hear his voice. But what would happen if you heeded Jesus' invitation to pray like this, in the quiet, by yourself, not with a long list of requests and demands, but simply being with God, enjoying him as he enjoys you, what would happen if that became a regular rhythm in your life? Well, I think what would happen is you would experience the last part of Jesus' invitation where he says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. There is a promise woven into this invitation of Jesus. And the promise is if you will take him at his word here, you will move into deeper places of rest in him. And the rest that Jesus offers, the rest that Jesus gives it's not like any other rest you can find. It's the kind of rest that heals you. It's the kind of rest that restores you. It's the kind of rest that actually empowers you to run the race that is set before you. But I also want to say that, just to be totally honest and transparent, I am no expert on this, okay? This is something that God has been challenging me in my own life and walk with him. I do not have this mastered in any way, shape, or form, okay? I'm starting to take some regular intentional times when I, when I have my time with the Lord. And honestly, I set a timer on my phone for five minutes where I just want to sit in silence. And I just want to sit and be still and be quiet before the Lord. And that's where I'm starting right now. But I would love to tell you that those five minutes are just this like tranquil, still as glass, beautiful moment. If you saw inside my head, it would be more like a pinball bouncing around with all the lights and sounds and stuff like that. I sit in my chair with the Lord and, I, and I'm trying to quiet my mind and just pay attention to Jesus. And I get there and I'm like, Lord, this is really good. And I take some deep breaths. And then in 15 seconds later, I'm going like, I wonder what I'm going to pack for my lunch today. Did Tamara make that chicken thing? That was really good. I should uh, wonder how we And then I'm like, oh, crap, I'm praying. Like, oh, man, what? What am I doing, right? And that, that, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be honest. Right? That's what it looks like a lot of the time. And so I just take a deep breath. I come back to the presence of the Lord with me, and I just continue. I don't beat myself up because that's not going to do anything, but I just I continue, and I keep 
practicing it, and I believe in time it will get easier. But as we close out our time together this morning, it only seemed fitting that as we speak on a message of silence and solitude, that we take a moment to do that here and now. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come before the Lord and listen to what he may want to say to you. And if this is new to you or you don't really know where to start, the question is going to be on the screen for you. And you can feel free to use that question or not. But the question is simply this, Lord, what part of this passage do I need to hear the most right now? Maybe it's the first part. Maybe it's the invitation of Jesus where he says, come, I want to spend time with you. Come and be with me. Maybe there's a lie in your heart that you don't really believe that. And the Lord wants to dislodge that. Maybe it's the second parts about silence and solitude and the Lord wants to speak to you about rhythms like that in your life. Or maybe it's the last part where he just wants to encourage you and remind you that when you come to him, you will experience rest. But whatever it is, We're going to take a few moments now in silence, both to practice a little bit of what we have just heard, but also to invite the Lord into what he may want to say to you. So I'm going to give us a few moments of silence now for you to come before the Lord, and then I will come and close our time in prayer together in a bit. Father, we thank you for the promise that is given in our passage today. That God, when we come to you by ourselves in the quiet, that we will find rest. Thank you that you long to give us your rest, that we would enter into a place of peace and joy, and that we would find the restoration of our souls. Thank you that you lead us beside still waters. Thank you that you lead us to green pastures. You restore our souls, Jesus. You are our good shepherd. We thank you. I pray for each of us, God, that you would be stirring within our hearts and minds a deeper longing, a deeper desire for intimacy with you in the place of prayer. And God, we know that intercession matters deeply to your heart. You call us to pray. But Lord, I pray that we would grow in our understanding of prayer, that it's not just laying out our requests, but it's being with you. And so take us deeper into that place, I ask and I pray. And I ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for engaging with us this morning.